Uh, so let's talk about testing. Um, we've seen some great successes with Chisel for accelerating RTL entry, but uh, RTL design is just one part of the design process, and for large design, apparently effort tends to be dominated by tests and verification. Uh, but first, let me be clear on what I'm going to talk about. This project is about effective ways to specify test stimulus, um, not more automated techniques like constrained random generation, fuzzing, or formal verification. Um, I'm mostly looking at improvements over the current peak poke tester, which has a few fundamental abstractions for interfacing with the simulator that you see here. Um, these are peak, uh, one moment. Uh, these are poke, which is assigning a value to a wire, expect, asserting that the wire value is equal to something, a step for advancing time by a clock cycle, and peak for returning the wire value as a Scala land numeric type. And for those of you more familiar with Verilog, this is basically Chisel's version of the non-synthesizable test bench. And overall, the one piece of feedback we get about the peak poke tester is that it's really easy to use, and this encourages unit tests. And we think that having small tests is helpful because they provide good localization power down to the individual module and repeatable regressions which enable continuous integration for agile designs. Now verification aside, tests also have documentation value because they show you how a block can be used in an intuitive imperative programming style. As nice as a peak poke tester is, it's not the only game in town. Um, Chisel also has an even more lightweight basic tester which is summed up by Chisel testing Chisel or building the DUT driver in Chisel. Its primary advantage is its extreme lightweightness. There's also the advanced tester which supports pre and post cycle action hooks. This is used to implement things like ready valid queue drivers. It's a very important use case but this tester uh, never got much traction. So basically what Chisel needs is some kind of unified test infrastructure, ideally one that satisfies the use cases of all the testers I just mentioned. So something intuitive, extremely lightweight, but also powerful. But in building the future, there's also insight to be gained from understanding the past. So let's take a look at the successes and failures of Peak Poke Tester. So first, what went right? Um, on the user phasing side, Chisel Tester uses Scala Test as its underlying framework, which is a unit testing framework similar to JUnit. It provides for test discovery, execution, and reporting. Basically, you write tests in a specific style, drop them into your sources folder, and it will find and run them. This low friction approach reduces barriers to testing and is something we want to keep. Now, let's take a look at a simple example. Here, this one tests a hardware GCD calculator, which the test you can see there. Um, GCD has kind of become the hardware hello world. It writes, uh, this test writes the input A and B values and then sets the input to valid. And as long as the output isn't valid, it advances a clock cycle. And at the end, it checks out the result is correct. And overall, that snippet right there of code should hopefully just make sense. Um, and the takeaway is kind of the imperative software model or the linear and time model is pretty comprehensible. And given a bit of understanding about the ubiquitous decoupled ready valid interface, this also provides a executable documentation about how you can use GCD. Okay, to be completely honest, I was being a bit economical with the truth there, or rather, with the code shown. It turns out that if you actually wanted this to run in Chisel testers, there's a bit more scaffolding. You have the Scala test test, which instantiates the DUT um, and the tester. Um, and, you know, though this code example is a bit misleading because I've collapsed some of the test logic, um, the ratio of test logic to boilerplate is not great. So this is the first thing that we want to fix. There's quite a bit of magic code in the driver invocation that basically ends up being cargo cult copy pasted and adds nothing useful, plus an unnecessary layer of indirection with the test body that isn't actually the test body. Um, and since GCD takes in a decoupled interface, one thing we can do is write test helper functions. Uh, so here you can see in queue for decoupled, that encapsulates the IO details. Um, this separation of implementation and interface allows test writers to think at a higher level of abstraction, uh, almost at a transactional level, instead of in terms of peaking or poking bits. And this results in less lines in the top level tester, um, for example, where a call for it to in queue can stand in for five lines of implementation. And this meshes pretty well with the Chisel philosophy where we enable users to build up and reuse test abstractions instead of aiming for the elusive, magical, full automation. 
Um, but there are two big problems with the implementation. Uh, first, test methods like poke can only be accessed inside the tester class. So final top level uh, test needs to extend every utility library and it tends to use, which basically means hello boilerplate. Um, second, all the test helper methods are in the same namespace, leading to potential for collisions. Um, in this example, in Q in particular, is something that's pretty generic and depending on your application could have different meanings. Um, and that abstraction style doesn't all carry over too well to sequences that span a non-zero duration. For example, if I wanted to test this very simple two-cycle shift register, um, where each, where I have the sequence poke, wait two cycles and expect. Um, but if I want to pipeline values into the shift register, um, like on the right hand side, um, I have to manually unroll everything and basically write the entire test manually. So takeaway is some kind of concurrency could help here. And overall, um, those previous examples give me four high level requirements. Uh, first, abstractions, they reduce test development effort, they're good. Uh, second, imperative model is understandable, but it needs concurrency support so that these abstractions can be extended to sequences. And then if you get into the nitty gritty, there's lots of opportunities for boilerplate reduction by minimalizing and disambiguating APIs. Uh, some of them, like that last bullet point I just made, have pretty trivial solutions. For example, the arcane driver invocation API could be simplified to something that provides sensible defaults and ask for minimum inf information. For example, here is just ask for a duck constructor. Um, and the indirection problem is also trivial, really solvable, just move the code into the test body. Hooray, that was easy. Um, and as far as namespacing, data types provide a natural namespace. So instead of a poke data type, um, we, instead of poking a data type, we could have poke be a method on the data type itself. So it would be data.poke. And this could be extended down to the rest of the API, including peak, expect, and step functions. So custom bundles like decoupled would be able to define their own methods like in queue, and another bundle type defining in queue would not alias. And uh, Scala implicits further allow adding test helper methods to existing data types, so you don't actually have to dump your in queue method in the base decoupled class. Um, for concurrency, we have two major options. One is the previously mentioned advanced tester solution where some callback is invoked per cycle. This callback has to maintain internal state, usually done by writing some finite state machine. Um, but that FSM is also scaffolding code, which reduces the ratio of boilerplate to core test logic. Um, in the imperative software model, threading is a common concurrency mechanism, which allows sequences to run in parallel. Fork spawns off a new thread, while join waits for a target thread to complete. The FSM we otherwise would have to write would now be implicit in the position in code, uh, and this would be maintained by the threading infrastructure, and this basically leads to easier tests. One major pitfall of threading, both across the software world and even in Verilog test benches, is race conditions, which basically means the order threads are run in can affect the outcome, such as if one thread clobbers operations from another. If you look at the example up there, where three threads simultaneously poke the same uh, wire, it's unclear what the result should be. And having a clear idea and limitations on ownership could help alleviate this, um, because that could be used to detect potential for non-determinism, and you could at the very least, tell the user, hey, you goofed, fix your test. Um, the thing about ownership is that you need an associate duration. And the simplest solution might just be, oh, you have poke, just tack a duration onto it. Um, but that puts more work on a test writer, which makes writing test libraries a bit more cumbersome. Um, and it also has no way to encode groups of related signals. For example, bits, uh, bits invalid um, always go together. So instead, if we look at structured programming, which is the formal language's term for your if and for blocks that replace the earlier go-to style programming, um, we can come up with the idea of a, encapsulating both a set of pokes and a duration in the, and the duration of those pokes uh, through the encapsulated clock advances. And this basically lets us implicitly associate durations with pokes. And furthermore, being able to override previous pokes temporarily works pretty well with your typical structure of having default values and then temporarily overriding them. So as an example, let's take a look at this piece of test code where I put the uh, previous and queue method inside this time or duration scope. So the first two lines basically set the valid to false uh, for the first two clock cycles. 
it then enters the scope, which associates the two pokes uh, to valid and bit with the single clock step. Here it overrides the previous poke that I've crossed out above and the scope and by extension the thread owns those pokes. And at the end of the scope, uh, those pokes expire too and revert to those previous values. So here valid goes back to false and bits becomes undefined and ownership also reverts. Though there's a whole bunch of more details into this that I'm not gonna go into, but this is the general idea. Scopes provide a lightweight yet elegant syntax for ownership. And this can not only be used to check conflicts, but also combinational read-write dependencies. So that's quite a bit on implementation details that solve individual problems, but how it all comes together is just as important. So I'm gonna go over two examples. First one, shift register, which was a motivating example for concurrency. Um, here I've defined the shift test helper function largely in the style that I wanted to earlier. Fork allows multiple instances of this to run concurrently and pipelines data into the shift register. And while there are no ownership conflicts here, time scopes make it clear which thread owns which wire. There's a few subtleties uh, here about thread ordering and it basically comes down to that um, for this to run correctly, there actually is a total thread ordering. So while we actually can't have non-determinism, ownership still helps detect programming mistakes. Um, here's the second example that shows the decoupled source test abstraction, which allows in queue on a decoupled I.O. object and its use in GCD. This basically turns the previous GCD example into effectively three lines of core test logic in queue, wait for ready, and DQ expect. Uh, short of building GCD specific abstractions, which we could also do, this is probably about as compact as it gets, making tests short and sweet. So the takeaway here is basically we want to encourage unit testing by making writing tests easy and painless, and Testers 2 aims to do this by minimizing boilerplate with intuitive, minimal interfaces, allowing reuse of test code by enabling abstractions. Concurrency extends this reuse to sequences and duration scopes establish ownerships while minimizing user cognitive overhead and allows the system to detect a class of programming mistakes. Uh, of course, Adept Lab prides itself not just on theoretical papers but also working usable tools and this is no exception. So while this is still kind of a work in progress, there is code online. So check us out on GitHub and uh, play off it. Questions? Thank you very much. So I have a very basic question. Mm -hmm. um, have you tried implementing this, like an abstraction for tiling with this? Abstraction for what? For tiling, if I want to test a tiling peripheral. Uh, so I haven't gotten that far yet, but in theory there's no reason why we couldn't have like tiling transaction level abstractions, especially because you have fork and you can pipeline things. Thanks. Does anyone else have a question? Anyone who is unclear how they're gonna use this new tester library? Oh, Adam. Uh, does this tester work for any um, like backend, like bear later or the interpreter? Yeah, um, so the first thing I've supported is treadle because, which is basically a type of hurdle interpreter um, because it fast and has very little spin up time, but it's modular enough that it can support any backend. There just needs to be development effort put into it. Is there a plan, is there a plan to support multi-clock? Yes. Everyone's asking for it. There is a plan to support multi-clock. Okay, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you very much. Thank you.